All right, y'all. Um, this is a Tuesday, and I have Mr. Jamie Sabalos here. He is the swing mechanic online, has been uh, teaching hitting as a consultant for a long time now, um, started off in the golf world, and has moved on and has made it kind of his um, life's ambition as far as uh, work goes, I guess, to learn how the best hitters in the world, past and present, do what they do. Um, his thoughts are a little bit different than what we hear generally, and I've reached out and he has graced me with his time today. And so with that being said, Jamie, how are we doing? Doing great. Thank you so much for uh, for reaching out. Like I said, I really respect that you're doing that. And, awesome. Uh, awesome. Well, I guess I'll just let everybody. So Jamie thinks um, about more of a front arm dominant uh, swing um, and you know, he does a lot of work with the best pound for pound hitters to ever do it and kind of what they do. And I'm going to let him just kind of break down his thoughts and how he goes about showing and instructing this. So it's all yours, my man. OK, so first, uh, you mentioned that I started off in golf. I actually. Um, baseball was my love as a kid. I was a huge Don Mattingly fan, unfortunately, um, yeah. because I wanted to copy his swing. I'm not a huge fan of his swing, but obviously <laughs> an amazing player. Um, I wish I had copied Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, so I started off in baseball, ended up being a, a dismal hitter um, my freshman year in college playing D1 ball. I, I earned the starting shortstop position Cause I was, I was smooth and flashy in the field, you know, and, and uh, so I was able to stay in the lineup, but I hit 196 my freshman year and uh, um, really got to a point where I was tired of playing half the game. I mean, I was basically playing for those one or two ground balls you got or a double play you could turn and my opportunity to, you know, look flashy and it was putting too much pressure on defense and, and uh and it just wasn't hitting. And hitting really is the fun part of the game. It's really the the area where a player can be the most valuable, the most easily, uh, most easily. So I got fed up and uh, uh, I was ready to quit. And um, I wouldn't be teaching the swing at all if I didn't have this experience where in my sophomore year, I made a a change and I'd made changes before, but I made a certain change that worked literally overnight. And I didn't think it would work like that. Um, I think very few players have this experience and, and very few hitting coaches that I see have this experience because when I talk to them, it doesn't seem like they, they have any notion of magic, the possibility of magic in swing mechanics. It really can happen overnight. And so I made this change the next day. I went four for four, which I'd never done in my life. I mean, every ball was a line drive. I wasn't getting the, I was getting a new ball flight on my hits. It was clear that there was something different going on. And this was against the College of Charleston, really the best team we would face all year. Um, within the next two weeks, I had two homers. I had never hit a home run in my life. I couldn't, I was one of those hitters who really couldn't hit an outfield fly. I couldn't really reach the outfield. Just slapping it um, around. Pardon? Yeah, just slapping it around. I mean, I was a big student. I was really into Charlie Lau. I had his book. You know, I, I assumed that that was the correct way, um, as most people did, and most people still are, or many people still are uh, today. Um, so I was hook, line, and sinkered into that whole approach. And it wasn't until I considered quitting baseball that – I was able to somehow step out of what was normal w with that thought of, Hey, this is coming to an end. I was able to step out of it and I made a change that actually worked. That change really came from ironically uh, Ken Griffey jr. A picture I saw in sports illustrated. And I say ironically because now 20 years later, after having studied the swing, he happens to be the paragon for front arm dominance. Uh, the the swing method that I teach. Um, and by the way, what do we always say about Griffey? He has the smoothest swing. He does it so effortlessly. And, you know, why haven't hitting coaches said, well, if he does it so effortlessly and, and, and it's so smooth and we regard him as the sweetest swing ever, maybe he's doing something correct in his mechanics. And 
that wasn't my thought process. It just kind of over the 20 years of studying the swing, I, I kind of came to this uh, front arm dominance realization, really studying what I've called the best pound for pound hitters. And it just so happens Griffey's right up there in the top uh, of the list. And, and to me could be argued as the best pound for pound hitter of all time. For those that don't know the formula that you use, can you share that for the pound for pound? Yeah, it's um, it's basically a, a formula where we are giving points for having a low body weight and also giving points for a high amount of power, which I define as at-bats per home run ratio. So the the equation, and by the way, I made this equation. I'm sure sometime in the future, someone could say, hey, you could structure this better. Um, I'm not a mathematician, but it works. It works in the way that it's giving you points for a low body weight and giving you points for a low at-bat per home run ratio. So it's, um, and you can get this on my website, theswingmechanic.com. You can download the free pound for pound uh, list, or you can view it on my website. Uh, it's one over at bats per home run ratio, that number times a thousand and then divided by the body weight of the hitter. And so again, it was just, a. I used at first I used OPS plus, but what I found with OPS plus is you just got too many guys who, you know, got their OPS plus number through batting average or got it through, you know, OPS plus is partly based on slugging and slugging is a good measure of a hitter's power. However, a large part of slugging is how fast the hitter can run because if he can turn a single into a double, double or a triple, double into yeah. a triple or a triple into a inside the Parker, then, you know, he's going to have a higher slugging. Um, real quick going back. So I studied the baseball swing. I, I was, so after college, after having that experience, I subsequently would lose my swing. And then that kind of propelled me on this mission to understand really what happened. Um, and I was willing to uh, to exalt the teaching of another if I came across somebody. I, I didn't care. I just wanted to understand the swing. And But the more I looked, the more I saw that maybe I need to just go on this journey on my own. Um, golf kind of became something I got into because I saw that same slotting action in the best golfers that I saw in the best baseball players. And now I understand that, you know, there are a lot of similarities between the golf swing and the baseball swing, um, mainly because it's a matter of squaring the club face or the barrel, which has a lot to do with getting the barrel into the zone while the back arm is well bent is essentially what it comes down to. In other words, getting the barrel into the zone, what I call early in relation to back arm extension. The reason why that's important is because it allows adjustability. Um, if your baseline position at contact is well extended, then you're basically relying on the flipping action. Whereas if you're here, you're not relying on flipping. Um, and if you need to, you can always adjust extending that back arm and reach the ball out in front. So what you find with the best pound for pound hitters is they're able to make a very connected position at contact, but they're also able to adjust and reach the ball out in front. I think that the, um, a couple things, I think that the word connection and the position is something that's misunderstood. Um, I think that there's a lot of people that simply think connecting on the backside where we're not pushing out or out from our body. Um, I don't think that unless you are a hitting guy and have talked to other hitting people that people truly understand connection at contact, right? They're just thinking about connection to here. And then as you turn, you release to contact. Um, and so that's why I, um, on your YouTube that I reached out, that was one of the things is like connection needs to be understood because you're going to have those people out in the world that are like, oh, well, the barrel, you know, gets out here and we need to be, you know, maximum power. We need to be more straight with this back arm and whatnot. And mm -hmm. that for me, when I've talked about it in those kind of terms, that's where the pushy stuff comes and you get into that rear arm and they're trying to get out there instead of allowing the turn 
having contact, like you say, more right arm, power arm, however people want to think about it. And so connection on the beginning, on the backside, but also connection at contact. Um, yeah. And that has to be broken down and understood or you do get that pushy. Um, and connection can also be in the front arm. Uh, the the humerus compression? Yeah, it, yeah. Can, it can be there too. Um, so it for for you then if, if i mean if you had to draw it up just perfect contact point would that be compressed and connected uh yeah the, the front arm well compressed and the back arm i would say well bent um okay. i don't like to really talk about the swing in terms of positioning necessarily because then people well we're talking about just analyzing a video yeah. And then, then yes, that's what I like to see. But if I was training a hitter, I wouldn't want him to, hey, try to be more compressed with the front arm because that oh. just leads to forcing positions. And and I learned a long time ago that that doesn't work. For well. sure. So with the I think the and this is me come from an outsider that works with a lot of young players and, and deals with a lot of parents. Um, okay. I think that you're like front arm dominant um gets people into the oh my god the arm bar you know and they and they worry about this arm bar and for me personally the arm bar is a problem if we go this way like out right and so away from the body not against the body um but when you talk about front arm dominant it almost sounds like to again not to me but to other people i would assume that that sounds like you're really pulling with your front arm when no. when in reality and, and tell me if I'm wrong or not in reality it's getting to this position with the humorous compression as you talk about but using the turn and not pulling in any way shape or form is that correct I, you know I think that kids will oftentimes learn the best way to swing completely on their own. Um, if you give them a heavy enough bat, I think the, a big problem is uh, that the bats are just so light that kids start off with many kids start off at three, four or five years old, just hit swinging plastic. And yeah. I think this is a big difference. I, I oftentimes make the argument that I think the sandlots were better uh, training grounds for, for hitters than what we have today, because the kids used, first of all, they saw live pitching Secondly, there weren't parents around. These are different issues, but I think they, those are important things. For sure. There weren't parents around. They were free to experiment on their own. We know from learning experts that if kids are free to experiment and not, you know, drilled and hounded, then they learn better. And and but three, and and this pertains to the swing, is they used wooden bats. And oftentimes probably bigger than what they should be using. Their dad's wooden bats. <laughs> right. Their dad's wooden bats. I mean, yeah. So what happens, and, and this is where I, I, I want to challenge what you said, because I actually just did a video recently about, um, about the myth of coming around the ball. I've, I've looked at a lot of video. Um, I actually don't see what people are talking about. Maybe you can enlighten me, but this whole thing where the front arm gets straight and then kids come out here. That doesn't happen. When you straighten your front arm, what tends to happen because of the, the weight of the bat basically gets heavier in relation to the fulcrum point, right? Because, you know, if you're in here, it's a different weight sort of as you're turning. Right. So what happens is the more straight you get, the more actually front humorous compression you're typically going to get. I don't when I see people demonstrating this, hey, the, the kid's getting like this, and then he's, he's – oftentimes they'll do a casting move with it, and then they say he's coming around the ball like this, and I'm like, I don't – if you're talking a dynamic swing, you get straight like this, you're just going to get more front humorous compression. Yeah, I, not, I, I, I think – and another reason that I find what you're talking about is intriguing is – you talk, and I excuse me if I get your terminology a little bit wrong, but you talk about the rear arm being kind of out of the equation. And that's where 
the casting for me comes. It's the change in the angle on the rear arm. And okay. So, and so when they come here and start to push out, that's when you see that working away from the body in young kids because they, they don't turn well. And if you are able to turn and not push out, that's what happened. And the coming around stuff, I think I, I'm in agreement. I think that people over exaggerate the move to show people, you know, it's not like, it's not like the ball's here and you're literally coming around it. Right. But for young players that don't have good turn, they don't have sequence at all. And they're trying to use their arms that push out creates kind of an out and drag move where you don't ever see like when you just demonstrated with your arm as soon as you started to turn that barrel worked into what we would call connection when kids get out of the turn and get into their arms and it starts to push out that's when that barrel loss kind of comes around and it's more of they're trying to get back over this way and so they're topping it more than they're actually coming around it. Yeah, I, I, if you don't mind, sh I'd love to see video of what what you would call coming around it. And okay. maybe you don't use that terminology, but I really just haven't seen, like the back arm exertion typically will happen naturally out towards the pitcher. There, There's no reason to me why a hitter would want to if he's hitting the ball that way to exert out this way because they push out they're trying to, and that's what i'm saying like the younger ones will get into that position right there except the barrel might be a little bit more behind your hand at that point yes but then but, as but this 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 i see as a good position because what's going to happen is as they get that momentum going forward you're going to get front humorous compression and you're going to get the hands more behind you. And I think what people do, and, and it's been going on in swing instruction for a long time, is they see a long arm and they think it's a long swing. That And long means takes too long. And so, like, they're just kind of using, it's almost like a, a semantics issue. It's like long equals long equals long. And... For me, long is the distance away. Like in that right there, I like that position. Like when you get here, I, I, this position I'm, I'm good with. It's away from the body. When they change the angle from the bicep forearm and they get going this way and you create all of that, that's when younger, weaker hitters start to pull instead of continuing to turn. And that's where the drag comes in. And now they end up flipping because they're trying to get here. And it's like, oh, crap, the barrel's not there. Let me get it there quick. And so that's that's what I see with the younger, weaker guys. Um, but if, if you have more distance here, what you're essentially saying is a longer front arm. If you're saying... Yeah, right. I mean, you can get, I mean, my arm's straight and I can get slotted where if I had a bat, it'd be here. But if I go this way and that arm changes, I mean, my arm, yeah, it's getting to a certain point. I'm, I'm big on maintaining a pretty small angle with the rear arm. I don't think about like slamming it into the slot. You know, I'm a, I'm a turn to slot guy. But maintaining this angle is something that I still or not maintaining is something I see a lot with younger hitters that get into their shoulders and arms, where it's just getting out here as opposed to humorous compression, rear arm along for the ride, basically, until it needs to go. And if I, I've got some of my weaker ones, man, um, I'll try to shoot some video. Um, and send it your way where that first move is kind of out and you can see them like fighting it instead of maintaining the turn. Can can I, do you want to look at some swings or? Oh, dude, I'm, yeah, I'm on, I'm on your time, buddy, until one o'clock. Let's do it. Okay. Let me, uh, let me share some video here. Uh, let me get to it first. Um, Okay. So let me see if I can figure out how to share this, share screen. 
Should be at the bottom. Um, Can you enable share screen for me? Um, share screen. Desktop. Oh, this is having me go through all sorts of stuff. It's okay if it's too much yeah. trouble. We can just. Uh, oh, I can't do that and record, it looks like. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I don't really know how to get you back now. Uh, there you are. So how long do we have, by the way? Uh, to, to, we got another 30 minutes or so. I've got a lesson that starts at one thirty. Okay. Um. Well, I was going to show a video of of uh, Albert Bell. Um, he's a he's a top. I mean, and, and there are other guys too. Uh, Albert Bell, uh, Stan Musial, um, uh, actually Jackie Robinson did this probably to the largest largest extent I've seen. Albert Bell is number six on the pound for pound list from. Uh, uh, hit a home run every fifteen point three six at bats, weighing. Anywhere from 190 to 200. Um, now he he did uh, he was very much basically like this, and just if you look at his swing online, he was just here, and then he just a lot of humorous compression, almost taking the hands almost completely out of it, you know. But when you take that, this is why I said like this is actually a pretty good drill and or swing change for kids who are very hands to the ball and flippy Yeah, is you just, you know, basically just take the hands out of it, just ex pre extend the bat and then tell them that you have to swing hard and hit the ball hard from here. What they're going to end up doing is getting a lot, getting a lot of hand depth and front humorous compression, however you want to call it. And basically using their body to then rotate into it. This is what bell did. Um, there's something called that I call forward bend, um, which contribute, which is a, we don't have to get that detailed and in depth, but the bat actually bends through the swing. Um, a guy named Larry Noble, uh, did work with Easton bats, um, in the eighties and did some studies on how the bat bending actually contributes to the overall bat ball system in, at contact. And uh, so you don't really need um, you don't really need to as you know there's a lot of talk about deceleration and stuff like that or or even just the you know in order to deliver the barrel to the ball they're saying you should you need to decelerate everything you really don't because the bat bends backwards as you start forward and then it kind of hooks naturally as you get into contact what is great about the front arm dominant swing structure is that you're getting backward bend happening back here whereas if you're very much here you're getting backward bend happening very close to contact and therefore it never really gets into forward bend or it gets very little into forward bend so by albert bell getting the hands very much behind him yeah, he didn't have a lot of this going on through contact because he cast it and he left it there. But he's getting a lot of backward bend. Well, he's getting a lot of forward bend because there's more space for it to go from backward bend into forward bend. Gotcha. Does that make sense? There's yeah, more no. space for that to happen. Whereas if you're coming like Derek Jeter and you're coming here, well, he was probably making contact with quite a maybe even the bat still being in backward bend yeah and so well, you get a lot of so these, inside out inside out the bat's not you're not getting the advantage of that forward bend which provides quite a bit of velocity in yeah. the assist well and i think is that what they're and i'm not a bad expert by any means but i think that's what they try to make happen for weaker players with the new bat technology you see those two-piece yeah. bats that have the, the Physically, you can see him almost bending through the swing yeah. uh, to allow that to happen for weaker kids. And that's another aspect of it. Um, do you think that this is beneficial for 
all players or is it just more strength? Because when I do it, like I've gotten a cage, man, after I started really like listening and, you know, the conversations that you have with people online, like I just went and got in a cage. I got a 34 inch wood that's bigger than what I would swing if I was to go try to hit right now and put it in my front arm and thought the first time I was like, okay, front arm, like that's what I'm thinking. And that got kind of away from me. Like that felt like it was going kind of out. And then I got more, okay, now I'm going to go back to more of the traditional, get into the hip, core turn and whatnot. And when I really isolated kind of that middle of the body core feel with that positioning, that's when I got really that natural kind of there you go. layback <clears throat> move. And it felt like everything just kind of flowed. Um, but I had to really concentrate on using the core for that. Um, what, what was the size bat? It was a 34-31. That's pretty big. Yeah. I mean, I, I, if I was going to go try to hit right now, I would swing like a 32, 29 and a half. So, I mean, it was. So, you know, I, I'm really moving towards having people start the front arm progression with a, a pretty big bat. And so I'm glad you started with a pretty big bat. I sell a training bat that is a smaller bat, but I think of the big bat to start with almost as training wheels. Um. Once you have the right kind of, once you feel the new structure, then I like a smaller bat. It's going to be more realistic in terms of what you're going to feel weight wise in the front arm with a regular swing. So I, but starting off using a big bat, it's going to pull you into these positions. If you think about like, uh, you know, tossing a, a stone as opposed to grabbing a sack of potatoes and tossing that. We want more of that that move where you're getting the body ready and you're you're you you have to with the sack of potatoes, you have to use the lower body. And so this bigger bat, I really like people to start off with that um, because it, it's just going to pull you into that structure, not just in the arms. Remember, the lower body will adjust and support whatever movements you're doing in the upper body. So if you change the up, and it may take some time, but if you change the upper body movements, the lower body is going to say, again, go back to the sack of potatoes versus a stone. Your upper body is doing a different movement, um, and therefore your lower body is. So if you throw the sack of potatoes, you're going to, it may take five throws or whatever, but eventually your body, your lower body is going to say, okay, I got this. We need to blank, whatever that move is. And and it supports that. It's the same kind of movement we need to move towards in the swing. Is this more getting the body into it? There's so much, you know, really taking the body out of it. And and you know, people point to a lot of major leaguers and say, look, look what he's doing, look what he's working on. It must be right. But I think we're kind of in a paradigm, even at the major league level, and guys out there don't think that major league level has some sort of different training than what's going on even at the little league level. Trust oh, yeah. me, this was a surprise for me too. When I started getting into coaching major leaguers back in 2002, yeah. Um you know, I was pretty amazed to see that okay, they don't they're not any there's no special knowledge here. These guys are just basically it's the same stuff that I was learning in high school. Okay. Yeah. Um but I think that for the most part, and this is hard for people to accept, but we're in a paradigm that is not very helpful um, and and is in many cases kind of the opposite of what you want to do. And you said in the beginning that, you know, I have some different ideas. You're darn right. If what I'm saying is true, and I believe it is. We're talking about a major overhaul of, of the way we do things in swing instruction. And I think that we're going to see, you know, I called it in my first book in 2009. I said that we're going to start to see when we understand the swing. And I didn't at that point, I'll, I'll readily admit. But I knew that the possibility for 
a change in swing instruction will lead to some huge changes. And I, I said, we're going to see, you know, maybe a, a, an 80 homer guy, the next 400 hitter, maybe that will be the same guy because I knew that guys like Aaron judge will come into the game. And those guys are, you know, I mean, I don't even know if I thought they'd be as big as Aaron judge. I mean, this guy is, He's is in, enormous. He's, he's not even – people don't quite realize we're not talking about the same and, human being. He came and hit in our facility in Houston, like in 2017 when they were here. Dude, wow. he is a mammoth. We had to readjust the cages. He is a mammoth man. Like, I, you know, and, and I think it's a big mistake in swing instruction now to – to point to guys like Bonds, like Manny Ramirez, like Miguel Cabrera, like Aaron Judge. No, we should be looking at guys like Ben Ogilvy. I know. I didn't hear from him. I didn't hear about him either until I made the pound for pound list. I had no idea who he was. Or guys like Oscar Gamble. These guys were 160 pounds. Yeah. And they were smashing. I mean, they were smashing homers at 160 pounds. What are they doing? And when you look at what they're doing, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys, but it goes against everything that's taught. You are much more of a historian with this than I am. And I know, I I, I don't know. I think I have an idea of what you're going to say to this question. What? How much research have you done on pitching velocity back in the day? Because everybody's like, oh, they could never hit at this day and age, because everybody's throwing the ball 98 to 102, you know, that's a real long, again, long swing that wouldn't play. Like, do we know, is there any way that does anybody actually, and again, I haven't researched pitching velocity. Do you have any idea like 1980 down what the average fastball might've been? I mean, is, is that argument valid on any level? Well, first of all, we didn't have, the same measurement tools, obviously. Right, right. Um, we measured mainly the speed of the ball as it was almost in the catcher's glove, from what I understand, as opposed to now they're measuring it Ow. right out of the hand. Yep. Um, uh, I, I, I also don't think that pitching speed is necessarily – um, a problem for hitters. I mean, the, the more speed, the farther you can hit the ball. I mean, yeah, it. I, I don't think that if Ruth was around today, and I'm one of these people who think it's a huge mistake to discount what Ruth did or what Mantle did, or and, and I know people want to dismiss that and they want to just laugh about it, And but look, Nobody played the amount of hours that Ruth played before he played pro ball. Nobody oh, I, put in. I think possibly Ruth played more baseball than anyone ever, who ever lived. And I don't, I don't think that any – well, I, I haven't come into contact with very many people that would ever discount that. Um, I think more of the question is – and that's interesting that you say that you don't know that pitching velocity – see, I think it does. I think that the the combination of some swing thoughts – but also the power arms and the spin rates and everything else. I think that pitching has evolved and makes hitting even more difficult. That's why I think what Luis Arias is doing right now is incredible. Like to, to go out and you have the starters pumping that, and then you have every reliever coming out of the bullpen pumping, you know, 97 to hundred. I think that the at bats throughout the course of a game for the most part, are more difficult than they would have been 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, uh, just because of the depth of pitching. That let me just concede that. Um, but it's still, let's say it's three miles an hour faster. What is it? Five, three, five. I don't know. I I would I would assume that man. And again, I don't know. You're probably talking low to mid nineties 
for the really good guys back then. And then, of course, you had your outliers, the Gibsons and the Seavers and the guys. I mean, it just really got it up there uh, where today, you know, you're talking 97 to 100. And then you've got dudes. I mean, that, that Duran guy from Minnesota, every fastball he throws is 103. I mean, it's so but I don't know. I Like I said, the pitching velocities, I just talking to people that have played, you know, um, in the big leagues. Um, around the world, um, college guys that I've worked with that are now trying to get into pro ball and whatnot. It's just, you know, the um, the difficulty of every at bat, you know, it seems like there's not like go up, hey, I'm going to get this guy. You know, he's throwing 92 pus and his curveball's not breaking a whole lot instead of the crazy movement and everything else. Um, there, there's also more to hitting than are more to tough pitching than just speed. No, for sure. Um, Movement, deception. Yeah, move, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but I one, I, I don't know if we can know if the pitching was really faster. I mean, if you look at video of like Nolan Ryan, you know, that's it looks like you can't get too much faster than that. I mean, I, I don't know. But yeah. let's say it's one, two, three miles an hour slower. People want to say, oh, well, then that would restructure the entire swing. Um, I think that that's, that's a little drastic. I, I just don't – I think that it's essentially the same game. And and by the way, you still have guys like Paul Goldschmidt who are very obviously front-arm dominant in his structure. You still have guys like Chris Davis who copied Ken Griffey Jr., by the way. Yeah. Um, there's definitely a guy. And I think that the other thing is the people that I associate with that move are, and that's why your pound for pound thing, like kind of got me thinking more because I see it. I see it in Goldschmidt. I see it in Acuna. Um, I see it in Jose Altuve. Mm -hmm. I see it, you know, Alex Bregman gets kind of straight cause he likes the ball up. Like I see it, but for me, all of those guys are elite turners. Like they are just when that front foot hits the ground, man, and they're ready to go, their turn speed gives that bat no other option but to come. And so that's kind of how I always thought about it is you got to be really strong in your turn to be able to pull this off against what I would consider higher velocity, um, which for me is anything 97 up at this point, uh, big league wise, 97 up would be plus velocity. Um and but you see these guys like the Vlad Guerreros, more boxy, um, you know, Bobby Witt Jr., more boxy, uh, Mike Trout, depending on pitch location, gets in, you know, this way. Uh, yep. Mookie Betts, very boxy after getting stretched out. Like you see this a lot. And I understand that some of this is timing and pitch location, right? I mean, it's going to react somehow to that. Um but I always had it envisioned as a very strong human move, not something that could be, I guess, developed not the right word, used effectively for, quote unquote, normal, younger hitters. And that and that's kind of where I was trying to to put this all together with you. Yeah, I, I don't I'm not one of those these people who say like. Yeah, but that works for this guy, but not that guy. And and yeah, but and we we see the greatest pound for pound hitters are all over the board. You know, there are guys who are small in stature. They're all they're I I think that we're enough alike that I mean we all have two arms and two legs, and well, <laughs> some hitters have one arm and, and actually if they use it as their front arm, they can do quite well. Um uh, there was a guy, Pete Gray, who used his one arm in the major leagues as his back arm. And he, you know, uh, was very much slappy and, and very extended at contact. There's a guy, a little kid, Tommy Morrison, who uses his one arm as his front arm. And he actually hit a couple homers at Cooperstown. And we'll see how he does as he gets older. But I think that that more connection at contact is really the key. I mean, what you just said is you talked about bets and you talked about trout. 
one thing about Betts and Trout and, and a lot of these guys is they're they're maintaining a lot of connection at contact. You can come, you can come here at contact uh, uh, in your approach. You can come more in front of the chest. But if you're if you're extending real hard and making contact well out in front, you're you're decreasing quite a bit of power. You can still hit for some high average, but to me, oh, um, I am all on board with the hands behind and and getting to this position and not getting like so. For me, that would be very disconnected. Like as soon as that happens, I'm disconnected from like in my view of connection. It would be here, yeah, and then release and and go through that. Um, the Trout and Mookie thing is number one. They're superstar athletes. I mean, they can do some things just on the fly that I think most normal. And when I talk normal, man, I'm talking about kids, like teaching kids. Like I think there's a, a base that you need to work through. I think there are basic fundamentals that apply to everyone. Um, yes. And then off of that, you may need to make some adjustments based on your athletic ability and whatnot. Like what you were talking about right there, when people get this, for me, that's because they are lacking turn ability. They don't trust their turn. And so they're using their hands as kind of a crutch. Well, they're back to me that that's just back arm exertion. Okay. And, and that's what I was going to say about bets or, or trout is that they, they don't get a ton of, you know, they're not like Ken Griffey jr. At the start with their, with a barred out lead arm. And do I tend to like to see more of a straighter front arm? I do. Um, I tend to like to see the hands left behind more. I do. It's not as prevalent today. You do see Goldschmidt. You do see Acuna. You do see uh, um, a few other guys uh, get straighter in that front arm. But you also see some guys who clearly are working on being more hands to the ball, more, you know. But to me, these are these are guys who are very front arm dominant still. Even though they've been trying to make these changes, they're still very front arm dominant because they're getting – a lot of connection at contact. They're not coming here and then extending hard with that back arm. If they were, they'd be a lot less connected. So it to me, that's showing a lot of front arm dominance in structure. Um, so, you know, I, I lost my train of thought, but uh, it just it's one something. of the, it's one of those things for me like te again teaching young players i see a lot of kids that don't have the athleticism they don't have the core strength they don't have the lower body stability to handle that turn and if you get them closer to the body now not right on the shoulder cuz that's obviously going to be one piece and you're going to get really pushy but having that more box position when they land and then using the turn, you're still going to get that compression. Like right now, my humerus is compressed against my chest, and I still have bend. Um, and it goes down to turn speed, and it's kind of one of those things. Like if I had, you know, a medicine ball back here at eight pounds, and I tried to turn and throw it, I could probably throw it a little further, but am I going to be quicker getting it out? And I think that that's what a lot of young players are trying to create is more of that quickness to the ball early instead of maybe the most powerful swing, quote unquote, getting back there, using the lever system, et cetera. And, well, it, may be front, and, and, and it may be front arm dominant like that. I don't think about that. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on here. Like front arm dominant for me seems more straight. Like you said, you want to see that more straight. If we can get into more of, of this and be front arm dominant, like to me, that all comes from core. Like if I'm sitting here and doing this, I'm not thinking about this front arm. I'm thinking about my core and getting that turn. And now that front arm actually starts to straighten out a little bit as I get into the turn, as opposed to having it back initially and trying to go. It just feels like a long, it feels like a slower move on the backside. Hmm. 
I'm not sure what to say about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. It it feels like if you weren't a very strong turner of your body, if you didn't have that stability, that getting into this position would be slower. Just swing speed would be slower than if you were right here. Because again, going back to like the med ball, if I had an eight pound med ball and I gave it to a 12 year old, six pound med ball, yeah. and I said, hey, I want you to put that back here. Like you get your front arm straight, compress here against your chest and have it back. And now I want you to turn and throw it. I think that they could probably throw it further than oh. if they than if they were right. Basically, basically, I think what you're saying is you can be faster to the ball. Yes. Okay. This is where I think swing instruction has overemphasized the importance of launch quickness and making contact. And those things are important. But if you look at some of the greatest pound for pound hitters, or it's just some of the greatest hitters, they were okay with missing. We're so over emphasizing, especially in little kids. It's, I think it's a problem because these are, they haven't developed their pitch recognition and or hand eye coordination yet. The thing you don't want to do is jump in there and officiously meddle with, with, their mechanics because their hand-eye coordination and pitch recognition isn't there yet. Or, or just like you said, their, their core strength isn't there yet. Right. It'll come, it'll come. And what I think we need to do is stop overemphasizing contact, be okay with missing, allow kids to swing hard as I mean, emphasize swinging hard. Now, people don't want to hear that because they think it's not the prudent, you know, approach. They think it's the irresponsible approach. But instruction in all sports has, over, has always veered way too heavily towards the conservative. You see this. I'm a big student of MMA and other sports, you know, as well. And I see it across all sports. The reason why they do that is because they're selling to parents and they parents want to hear prudent safety all this stuff. And coaches want to come off as prudent. And so in our swing instruction culture, I think that we need to not overemphasize. Yes, contact, making contact is important. I mean, I, I obviously, um, and quickness to the ball is important too. Um, but we're, we're so fixated on that and I don't think that our way of solving it is even correct. A lot of times the way of solving it is to just kind of nudge your hands a little closer into the body and, and kind of get them there real fast. But look, when you do that, remember, we don't hit the ball with our hands. So as you're getting the hands closer, well, now you're pushing the hands out and the barrel's hanging back. I just don't so, know anybody in my network of coaches that actually teaches that. Like everybody that I work and talk to and deal with teaches this yes okay yeah like, but it yeah. ends up being that josh if, if you don't i mean this is you know with trout and and bets they're still leaving the hands sort of behind if you look at the shoulder line 1000 okay so the shoulder the hands are sort of more in the direction of behind you all right so you're right they're not actually doing this um but, you know, it and and they're so they're they have the overall kind of what I would call front arm dominant structure because the hands are still left behind. They're still, as you said, getting some front humerus compression. Not everyone is as flexible as Griffey and is going to get this like Jimmy Fox was the same way. And, and Babe Ruth had a lot. Ted Williams had a lot. I think it's better to have that flexibility. But. You don't need it. It's not that necessary. Um, what's important is the overall structure is what I call front arm dominant. And you're kind of dragging the hands to start, you know, and people, people don't want to see that with kids. They want to see, they overemphasize the contact and they start, you know, 
maybe not you. I mean, it sounds like you're well, you I, like just and and the people that I, I at this point network with, I see a lot of that in very young coaches that are just coming out of college or have gotten back into it. You know, they played in high school and then they decided to get into it or whatever. And that's what they were told and they don't research it. But the majority of people that I talk to nowadays truly believe in the sequence and the barrel depth behind and hands behind, you know, or right off the shoulder. As we turn, we're getting into the slot. We're not pushing. Um, talk a lot about, I call it a hand pivot which would be as the turn goes kind of in the same place right there, as opposed to any push. Um, so I, I think that parents want to see contact. And so they, they have that conversation. And then I think that there's hitting coaches myself that I don't care if you swing and miss, man. Like, obviously we don't want to go and strike out all the time, but hit the ball hard, like swing almost I have my guys and girls most of the time we'll have reps where I'm like, dude, I don't care if you almost fall down, swing it, you know, figure out how to have intent and swing it hard. Um, you know, I saw again on the post that you had of that guy and he was literally teaching down chop. Like I know that that was a thing. I just don't see that nowadays nearly as much online with the people that I discuss what you were talking about in the position that you are getting into is what I talk about is what other coaches that I deal with talk about. It's just the description of the front arm dominant. Um, I think might throw people off that don't listen to you or really understand it because yep. they see, like you said, they see long, they think disconnected and slow. They they're not getting the, take this out of the equation. And if you just hold a bat straight up in the air and start to turn, it falls right there. Like yep. it naturally happens. Yeah. So what I would do is, you know, you like this position. I think it's fine. You don't like maybe a barred arm, you know, no, I, as um, long as the bat stays closer to the shoulder, as we turn, I'm good with whatever. And that's what I said. The front arm reacts to pitch location. And then you said it very well the flexibility to get all the way out here may be reserved for a special few. It is not a bad position. The turning or like I talked about earlier, the getting away from yourself as you're turning is what I see young players have the problem with. Um, I know you have to go. Um, oh yeah, it's one, but so, I don't have to go this minute, but. So I would just, where you can go wrong if you're looking at a Betts or a Trout from here is you don't do what they do as they turn through contact, which is, again, to me, they're very front arm dominant in structure through contact, especially because they are sort of squaring the barrel up with the rotation, with the pull here, rather than trying to square it up with the extension of the back arm. Using the so turn they don't contact. have a lot of back arm extension as they go through contact. Right. They're turning to contact. They're turning into contact. So um, whether you're, you know, real straight with the front arm or not is, is not, you know, it's not a huge factor. Um, again, I do tend to like a, a little straighter front arm, but not everyone has that flexibility or is comfortable with that. That's why I say pick up a bat, use your, just your front arm. Oh. And, and what do you feel now? A lot of people are like, yeah, but what about the back arm? The back arm, you know, what are we going to swing with one arm for the rest? No, but we're all in this culture so back arm dependent. If you, if you were to just ask me what's the main problem mechanically, I would say that the plastic bats and the the instruction and the uh, um, the, the tendency to put righties on the left batter's box and righties and and lefties on the right batter's box. All this makes for way too much back arm exertion, back arm extension. Um, and so we just need to move. If we're if most people are 60% back arm dominant and 40% front arm, we need to move to the other side of the spectrum. We just need to be more front arm dominant. Again, the back arm obviously contributes, but you need to think of it more as 
I mean, for most people, you know, it's going to feel like for a while that your front arm is doing everything. In fact, that's what happens in the front arm progression. You're only using your front arm for the first step. I often tell people stay on that first step for like a day or a week. If you don't have any gains, just focus on that. Just swinging with just your front arm to build these muscles that really haven't been built to build the movement pattern that hasn't been built because the back arm is just involved all the time. It's taking over the swing. You know, it's it. you don't notice it because we just the same way you don't notice at the end of the day. Wow. My right arm is tired from writing all day. You just don't notice it. We're we're dominant in a hand without noticing it. So you need to just go to the other side, experience that that front arm only, and then just Add work it, it to where the back arm is is just supporting that move. Once you can deliver a lot of power with that front arm by itself, you'll be okay with letting that back arm just support that movement. And I, it's not to say the back arm doesn't do much. One, I mean, that support can be a lot. Plus, if you're a little early on a pitch, you, we're going to have to extend the back arm to reach the pitch. So I'm not at all saying that the back arm is not involved. And front arm dominant probably is a little bit of a misnomer, but... Um, I guess I just didn't know what else to call it. I think that that's the best way to, to call it. Um, we all need to move more towards front arm dominance um, in the swing. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, I really, really appreciate your time. Um, I, like I said, I've been experimenting with this and I've seen some good things um, just in how I go about explaining it to my younger players. Uh, this conversation has helped dude. Um, so again, I appreciate your time and let's do it again sometime. Absolutely, man. I appreciate it, too. Awesome, awesome, man. We'll see you. All right, Josh. Take care. All right, bud.